Welcome to Diplomat TV. In this episode, we start with Torbeke. After almost 150 years, the Dutch statesman Johan Rudolf Torbeke finally has his own monument in The Hague. Near the center of the Dutch Parliament, a great marble statue of the statesman has arisen. It is accompanied by three contemporary statues made of stainless steel to connect the present with the past. Could I ask you a question? What do you think of this monument? It's beautiful. Yeah? What does it resemble to you? Uh, a teacher. A teacher? Okay. That man that you see on the left in the marble is the man who, who made our constitution. So uh, he's looking at the tower that you see over there, mm -hmm. and that tower is where our prime minister reigns. Uh -huh. It's the connection. The connection, of, yeah. yes. Johann Rudolf Torbecke was born in 1798, and he was an important Dutch statesman with a liberal foundation. In the year 1848, he revised the constitution of the Netherlands, giving less power to the king and more to the states general. He is regarded as the founder of parliamentarianism in the Netherlands. In February 2017, the monument was unveiled. In attendance, the initiator of the monument, the former city councillor, Tessa Osterholt Eckhout. The, the woman over there? People don't know what she exactly is. She might be a secretary, she might be uh, a teacher, like a you teacher, say. Yes. But people don't know. So young Ambassador Max went to Strom Den Haag for the exhibition, A Matter of Time, Tom Pookie and the Torbecke Monument, to learn more. Hi, Max. Hi. Hi, welcome. Let's start over here. So is this the only monument of Torbecke? No, there are actually two other monuments of Torbecke, one in Amsterdam and one in Zwolle. And uh, the monument in Amsterdam was founded just after he died and it was supposed to be located in The Hague, but at that time Torbecke had too many political opponents which didn't like to see him after his death again, so therefore the monument was replaced to Amsterdam. This was also the reason why uh, 10 years ago the municipality of The Hague um, invited an artist to make a new sculpture for Torbecke, because it was a sort of historical mistake which should be repaired by this. The question to the artist was to represent him as a thinker, as a philosopher, because Torbecke was a um, professor in law and for many years taught at the University of Ghent in Leiden. So before he came to political power, he had already a long experience of, of European law and therefore he is also uh, interesting for contemporary times how the Netherlands could take part in a European, more wider picture. So, what materials did the uh, artist use in this monument? Well, he, he used marble for, for right. Torbecke as a classical material for a sculpture and uh, stainless steel for the more present situation where you can see three people in sort of negotiation uh, interact. And wh why stainless steel? What does that exactly resemble or doesn't it have to resemble anything? It's the, it's the confrontation of the two materials, okay. uh, the, 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 the past and the present. I'll show you the exhibition. Okay. What was the role of Strom for the choice of the Torbecke monument? Well, Strom advises the municipality about art and public space. When there will be a, a new monument erected, they ask Strom to um, to form a committee and for this commission we were asked to, uh, to provide a list of artists who could make such a huge monument. Why did they choose Tom Pucky to make this Torbecke monument? Well the committee chose his design because the question was to represent Torbecke 
as a scientist, as a thinker, as somebody who had a vision for the future. And Pucky's design was the best answer for this question. Well, cinema is really important for Pucky. So especially this scene with the window and the two shutters. Yeah. It's also very present in the exhibition. It's again this, the symmetry. And it's really um, a magnificent take. Um, the film was shot in 1975. And it's a one take, it lasts seven minutes. Huh. And the camera moves from, the, uh, from a room to outside to a square yeah. and then going back to the room and in the in the in that time the 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 main character in the film is being shot it was very interesting to look through the lens of the uh, Torbecker monument uh, into the the works of, of Tom Pucky as they show a sort of ongoing threat through his works which are about mirroring, about doubling, symmetry and many references to art, art history, science in a sort of pseudo-scientific way. And um, I think the scientific approach is also something which really reflects on Thorbecker as he was a, a scientist in the first place. Could you tell me a little bit about this artwork? This is a very important work for Pucky. It was seen before in the Stedelijk Museum in the 80s in a very important exhibition of Mike Kelly. And it's sort of very symmetrical piece. You could see this as a kind of a centerfold, um, where uh, as a catwalk. In this work, in True Light, you can already see the first appearance of working in this style by working with puppets. And uh, uh, not puppets like here, made in sort of crafty German way, but puppets, as you can see them in sort of Victorian style with the clothes and uh, uh, the kind of puppets which are uh, shown in displays. And they're holding these two lenses of mirrors. And this is uh, part of this sort of, um, um, the, the sort of language which Pucky uses in his, in his older pieces, which are dealing with semi um, scientific instruments referring to Spinoza or paintings of Van Eyck. So there are many references to uh, art history and this is typically something from the 80s. Well this is a portrait of Thorbecke painted after his death and it's, um, it's a loan from um, the Rijksdienstkulturele Erfgoed and it was, it was given uh, it was special permission by the Prime Minister because it was hanging in his office. This piece is called Spinoza. It's a very clear reference to the monument as it has the same kind of door frame as in the monument. And it's called Spinoza because it has the two lenses which are referring to Spinoza as a The Hague-based philosopher, scientist. I always think it's fascinating to see how marble is carved in this detail. Can you tell me a little bit about how this artwork was made? For Pucky, it's always very important to uh, use analog techniques using a live model, um, clay, wax, and endlessly modeling the work. And finally, the, the, the plaster copy will be brought to Italy, where they select the marble and uh, carve it, first the rough form by computer and then very detailed by craftsmen in Carrara, in Italy. Mm. What is the relationship between nudity in this exhibition and Thorbecke? The, the female figure is for him um, more the other. It's about looking, about um, a certain direction of looking. So therefore, I thought they should be present in, in this exhibition. A matter of time, who chose this title and why did they choose it? Actually, it was the suggestion of Tom Pucky. He, um, a, matter of time, a matter of time is because it's, it's, it's about the, the relation of Thorbecke and the contemporary and how you move around it, how okay. you move around the sculpture. To what date will the exhibition be opened? 
The exhibition at Storm in Haag runs until the 27th of August. Today, young Ambassador Ayushi visits the Dutch Supreme Court. My name is Ayushi and I'm from New Delhi, India. And I'm a master's student of international relations in the Netherlands. Joining Diplomat TV is a gateway to a very fun and practical way of exploring the different institutions, cultures and communities within the city of The Hague. And I'm really excited about it. Hello, I'm Mireille. Welcome at the Supreme Thank Court. You. I was wondering, could you tell us a little bit more about these statues? They are uh, all professors in law and they were important for the development of Dutch law and also international law. And uh, uh, this one, Hugo de Groot, he is the most famous of all. The device of the Supreme Court is from him. It's in Latin, as you can see. And it means where law ends, war starts. And I think this device stresses the importance of an independent judge, or you could also say the rule of law, so that every citizen is subject to an independent judge, including government itself. Oh wow, this is a beautiful building. Can you tell us something about the design? Yes, it was designed by uh, two architects, Kees Kaan and Vincent Panhuizen. And as you can see, the main characteristic is transparency. And uh, transparency is important for any court, but especially for a Supreme Court. Here you can see uh, the busts of our uh, three previous queens and our recent king, Willem-Alexander. Okay, but why are they here within the context of the Supreme Court? Well, the king, now we have a king, is the head of state and the head of state is always uh, represented in, a, in any courtroom, so also in the Supreme Court. Let's uh, continue. The historic book collection is over here. Oh, okay. Can you tell us something more about this fascinating collection and particularly how the Supreme Court came to acquire it? It's a very old collection. The oldest books are dating from the 16th century. Mm -hmm. And it came to the current Supreme Court through previous Supreme Courts. And it's called the Court of Holland collection. As you can see here, we have an original work of uh, Hugo de Groot. And that's his Latin name, Hugo Grotius. And why is it still relevant that they are here on display within the Supreme Court? They tell us something about the legal knowledge um, they, what, that, that was there in those times. And it tells uh, us something about how these predecessors worked. I'm curious, what are you going to show us next? Well, we have an interesting painting that we can have a look at. So let's uh, go to see that. Okay. So this is the painting that this I want to show you. This is such a big painting and it looks so interesting. It's made especially for this building and it's made by Helen Verhoeven mm -hmm. and then it's called the Supreme Court. You see the justices of the Supreme Court sitting in a sort of court hearing situation and uh, here you have society and uh, the rulings of the Supreme Court concern society. And on the walls you see pictures and these pictures have something to do about how the Dutch law came into existence. It's about power, it's about justice, it's about injustice. You see violence, you see over there there is the quite brutal murder on the brothers De Witt. You see uh, philosophers, there is uh, Spinoza, Erasmus, um, important Dutch politicians, like over there you see Thorbecke, you see Lady Justice, so you have Justice White and opposite you have Judith who, who took revenge, her own revenge in black. And that's basically the story of, um, of this painting. All the justices you see are fictional, except for one, and that's the president. He was the Jewish president during the German occupation in the Second World War. 
And um, this Justice Visser, he was fired by the German occupier. And the problem was that none of the other judges of the Supreme Court publicly protested. They didn't do anything publicly. He was sent home and in the same year he died. And in the years after that, nobody spoke about it. So it's a sort of a, a black page in the history of the Supreme Court. And in order to honor him, he has his place back as a president. And if you look over there, you see his name, the Justice Visser courtroom. The Supreme Court of the Netherlands is a court of justice. It is the highest court in our country in three fields of law, civil law, criminal law and tax law. Also, uh, Judge Veteris, what does the Supreme Court actually do? We should realize that there are every year in the Netherlands about 1.7 million court cases and it would be practically impossible for a Supreme Court to retry even 1% of all those cases. So for a Supreme Court to be able to give added value, we must do something different than just duplicating what the lower courts have done already. And we do that in our function as a cassation court. And it is to say that we can only quash a decision of the lower court if that court has violated the law and we do not reevaluate the facts as they have been established by the lower court. So what we do is we give an interpretation to the law in more or less abstract terms which will give guidance for the decision in often many other cases and we think that's the best way for a Supreme Court to give added value for lawyers and for the society as a whole. What can you tell us about the history of the Supreme Court? Our Supreme Court was established in the 19th century, to be exact, in 1838. That was not so long after the Netherlands became independent, one unified country with a unified legislation. And we had a courts of appeal in every province, every region of our country. And people feared that when there is one uniform legislation, but in every province, capital, there is a uh, specific court that there would be differences in case law of all, in all those parts of the country. And to get unity also in the case law, there was the establishment of one Supreme Court for the unity of the law. International law has become more and more important these days. What does this mean for the working of the Supreme Court of the Netherlands? And how do the various Supreme Courts of Europe work together in this regard? We are confronted frequently with international and European law because the Netherlands is a small country, it's a trading country and we have a lot of contacts, uh, the parties and all people in the Netherlands with other countries. And for that reason the Netherlands has concluded a lot of treaties, international treaties with other countries and as a Supreme Court it is our daily work to apply and to interpret those international treaties. And as far as the EU law and the European Convention on Human Rights are concerned, is also treaty law. We also have to do with the international courts, the European Court for Human Rights and the Court of Justice of the European Union. And their interpretation of the treaties is binding for us. So we look very well at their case law and we also on a personal and functional level have frequent contact with those courts. What can you tell us about contact with high courts in other countries? We are confronted with similar problems and sometimes we see that instinctively we give the same solution to these problems and that makes us more certain that's, uh, that it's the best solution. But it also may turn out that other countries, uh, even similar countries, give a, a totally different solution for the same problem and that other way around it can be also a very good solution. Well, and in an Einstein way, it makes uh, all things more relative and as more humble and more creative in finding our own solutions. And if you look, you see that many of those uh, former presidents have books. And the last president, as you can see, has a book, but he also has an iPad. Well, thank you so much for letting us in and for speaking to us and showing us around this wonderful building. It was thank a pleasure you. to show you around. Thank you. I'm delighted to announce that the winner of the World Justice Project 2017 Rule of Law Award is President Jimmy Carter. The 
WJP is proud to present this award to President Carter in recognition of his lifetime of distinguished service and achievements in promoting peace, human rights, and the rule of law worldwide. On July 10th to 13th, the World Forum hosted the fifth edition of the World Justice Forum. Welcome, Yelta. Thank you. Um, Yelta, let's start off. If, uh, if we look at the world today, uh, we see uh, a ring of instability around Europe. Um, an increase in conflict, uh, humanitarian crisis, we have migration, we have terrorism, um, and in many of the countries around us, fast-growing young populations. And I was just wondering, how do these challenges affect foreign policy of the Netherlands? Let's just uh, use one of your phrases and go down into that first, because one of the things that is really impacting the way that we form policy and try and implement and solve problems is that most of the issues that we talk about right now, the migration crisis and the ring of instability, are all framed in a very negative way. Um, why is there a migration crisis? Migration has been there always for a long time. Why is it now suddenly perceived to be such a big crisis? The ring of instability gives a very Eurocentric sort of perception about security as if insecurity is something that was recently invented and Europe is now becoming the first victim. I think it's all in, in matters of framing, it could be done in a different way because if things are more focused on the facts instead of the political framing around those facts, we could come up with more positive and creative solutions as well. What is the objective of the World Justice Forum? To bring people from all walks of life from all over the world together to expand and enhance their understanding and appreciation of the rule of law as a foundation on which society is built. It's like the immune system of society. When crime or violence come, if there is a strong foundation, for instance, strong accountability, checks and balances, freedom of the press, open government, access to information, these basics are in place, society will be better. The WJP Anthony Lewis Prize for Exceptional Rule of Law Journalism was created to acknowledge journalism from around the world who have contributed to increase awareness and understanding of the foundational importance of the rule of law. I am pleased to announce this year winner of the WJP Anthony Lewis Prize for Exceptional Rule of Law Journalism. This is the Center for Investigative Journalism of Serbia, CINS. The World Justice Forum is the global gathering of the World Justice Project. And the project is a movement uh, that seeks to advance adherence to the rule of law worldwide. So we work in over 100 countries and uh, we, our mission is simply one, which is to promote greater adherence to the rule of law. We understand the rule of law as a homegrown culture. We are not promoting the Anglo-American rule of law or the European rule of law. We are promoting a homegrown culture of adherence to the set of basic principles of society. This is the foundation on which society is built. That, if you use a soccer analogy, is fun to play soccer, but it's even more fun when you play by the rules and you follow them, and the rules are fair. What are the highlights of this event? The, we do not seek to achieve grandiose um, new ideas because we believe that the rule of law is something that is built like a brick by brick. You, bring, you build up a house brick by brick. And the secondly, we do not believe in one-size-fits-all solutions. So we believe that uh, interaction and cross-fertilization is useful. And a lot of this happens in coffee breaks around. Um, so I'm not looking for great statements. We are looking for a connection. Why The Hague? The Hague is perceived by people around the world to be the city of peace and justice. It's the place where uh, these justice issues are discussed. And uh, it's a neutral forum. If you go to the fundamental tenets of all cultures, things like having an impartial judge, 
that will hear your case and defend you from abuses are present in all cultures. From the judicial guidelines of the Second Caliphate of Islam to the Magna Carta to the American Constitution, you find these common elements all over the world and they are all um, being threatened right now. It is a time in history in which um, many people are advocating for separation, for uh, each culture having its own way, and we are forgetting that we are one global family. And this one global family, if it is built on respect for each other, basic understanding of the basic rules and, and um, adherence to them, it will have a more peaceful and prosperous society. Thanks for watching Diplomat TV. For any feedback, ideas, or suggestions about our program, please email us at contact at diplomattv.com. You can watch this and other episodes at diplomattv.com.